Welcome. I'm Roberta Glass, and you're listening to my True Crime Report. So on December 16th, 2004, in Skidmore, Missouri, 36-year-old Lisa Marie Montgomery strangled to death Bobby Joe Stinton. Bobby Joe Stinton was 23 and pregnant. Montgomery cut the baby out of Stinton's stomach and fled the scene. Montgomery was quickly apprehended and arrested. The baby miraculously was found with the killer unharmed. Montgomery was tried and found guilty and sentenced to death in 2007. On January 13, 2021, she was executed by lethal injection. To talk with me about the campaign to commute Montgomery's sentence, is friend to the show and true crime researcher extraordinaire, Shana. Shana can be heard in our previous episode about Dorothy Otno Lewis's documentary, Crazy Not Insane. Welcome, Shana. Hi, Roberta. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. So <clears throat> can we talk, a, I mean, this is really one of the most horrific crimes ever. Absolutely. Um, what makes this so heinous? You know, she um, she tricked the woman into, she used a fake name. She tricked the woman into thinking she was coming over to buy a puppy. She brought, um, she brought her own like midwifing kit. She performed a cesarean section. She strangled the woman. She woke up during the C-section, strangled her again. But ultimately, Bobby Joe died of blood loss, stole the baby. I think the the one detail that sticks out with me the most is that the baby was fine, except for having a small cut above her eye, which is one of the most horrifying things I can think of. Like, you cut the baby out, but you didn't make sure not to cut the baby. Right. Or- and- and Bobby Joe Stinton was a rat terrier breeder. So they got to know each other online. Yes. And uh, uh, Stinton knew everything about rat terriers and their how to breed them and went into their genealogy. And she was really knowledgeable. And so they met, they knew each other, um, and they confided and Montgomery was confiding online with, with her that I'm pregnant too. And they were talking about their yeah. pregnancies. Obviously Montgomery's was a fake pregnancy. She was lying to her husband and her children and, you know, wearing maternity clothes. Um, yes. But I think the element of this, she comes over under a fake name to buy this dog and they let the puppies out to play. And that's amongst yes. these puppies she's murdering this woman and stealing her bait it's so awful and by all accounts from bobby joe's friends she was so loved and such a lovely person what a horrible loss from what i read that there was some uh there was a problem with lisa montgomery in the rat terrier group people Mm. were saying that they did not believe that that her dogs were of a specific breed or something. And Bobby Joe actually was standing up for Lisa saying, maybe there was a mistake. You know, I don't think she meant to trick you. So Bobby Joe was a very nice person and Lisa Montgomery was taking advantage of that. Wow. It's just, it's so unreal. And, you know, once again, you know, I wanted to talk about this because, you know, how you feel about, you know, however you feel about the death penalty, I wish these death penalty activists would just argue their case and not use cases like this. Yes. To speak of some wonderful person and what a loss for society and go through all this kind of ridiculous propaganda to yes. as a way to commute her sentence and, and sort of weaken the death penalty. And in so many states, we don't have the death penalty anymore. And this is a federal case. So what makes this a federal case? And what's the difference between a federal case and a state case? A federal case is tried by the federal government. So it follows the rules of a fe- of the federal government. Each state has different laws. Um, and so 
if certain states don't have the death penalty, that's different than being charged with a federal crime because the federal government does have the death penalty. And this was a federal crime because it was kidnapping across state lines. She was from Kansas. She went to Missouri and she brought the baby from Missouri back to Kansas. Kidnapping that resulted in death. Yeah. Was also. Yeah. And so they did a superseding indictment that it was particularly heinous. And that's also one of the other heinous things. And one of the reasons they could track her so fast, so quickly is that she went, she had two and a half hours, you know, yeah. to think about this and turn, and turn around. Yeah. And she, no, she wasn't turning around. <laughs> right, exactly. And she already had four kids. Now, does that, do you think that makes it worse? I think it does. She wasn't just a sad, mentally ill woman who desperately wanted a baby. She had four children that she wasn't a particularly good mother to. We can get to that later. And she was facing losing custody of two of them to her ex-husband. And that seems to have really set her off on like, I need a baby now because she had faked so many pregnancies beforehand that he was going mm -hmm. to use it against her in court. Right. Exact. Right. Exactly. That's a good thing to bring up. So, you know, time was ticking and she had announced yeah. this pregnancy. She had yeah. to get a baby. And I do, I agree. I do think it makes it worse because it's almost like, well, someone's so desperate for money, they rob a bank, not like that ever, you know, rob a <laughs> bank and then they throw away. I don't know if it's like throwing away the money or it's like they already have or sitting on a pile of cash at home. Yeah. And it just... She you wasn't know, going so. to offer this baby an amazing life. She'd already no. failed as a mother. And yeah, it's so so I wanted to just look at eight minutes from Vice News. Yeah. Um, let's see. Did I um and bear with me? Um, this yeah. is the first time I'm using uh StreamYard here. So oh, before we watch the Vice News thing, um uh, what do we know about her trial and her appeals? So she, her trial, she had her lawyer, her team of lawyers seems to have been changing a lot over the time, which mm -hmm. isn't uncommon. But I think her main trial lawyer was, was his name Duchart? Du, Duchart? I think they, do, do they pronounce it Duché or Duchart in this? Yeah, something like uh, that. Yeah. Anyway, he was, He's apparently known as the lawyer with the most clients on death row, which mm -hmm. apparently um, it's not. He can, we can get into that after. He gave her a very strong defense, I thought. He didn't mm -hmm. want to say that she was. Um, he didn't want to use the mitigating factors for guilt or innocence regarding mm -hmm. her childhood. He decided to say that she had. Oh God, I can't remember the term pseudocesis, which right. is like faking pregnancy, but you genuinely believe that you are pregnant. Um, and unfortunately, there's so much evidence that the federal government had that she wasn't delusional, that she mm -hmm. knew that she wasn't pregnant. And that mm -hmm. is like the number one thing. Like if you're delusional, you don't have to prove that you're pregnant. You just believe it. She clearly didn't believe it if she was going to figure out how to go steal a baby. And, right. and you'll hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, you go. Uh, you'll hear from her sister, Diane, her half sister, Diane, in this. And just take note. They say that. The sister, Diane, was removed from the family and adopted by another family when Lisa was four. But in in the court documents, they say that she was three. Yeah. So it sounds like, and I want to give like a little bit of a warning. It's, you know, some really strong material uh, that she talks about, sexual assault, incest. But it sounds like when she's talking about it, that she witnessed it herself. Yeah. But I don't under it doesn't sound like this it doesn't mesh with the time that she was in the home and Lisa no, was exactly. she's talking about age zero to three. So, mm -hmm. you know, she's talking about her talking to police officers, not telling them something. And I don't think you would expect that of someone under three, no? No. And I Lisa never claims that this happened when she was a baby or a toddler. 
this right. stepfather seems to have come into her life later on. Right. The one who abused her. Um, so it's this, none of this was brought up at trial. Abuse mm -hmm. by her stepfather was brought up during during trial. Everyone seemed to have agreed except the stepfather that she was at some point sexually abused by him. Correct. That's all that really came up. There was none of this torture POW mindset that you're going to hear in the video. Mm -hmm. Like this, this just wasn't available. This wasn't information available to anyone because it, certainly not her lawyers who sought out, actively sought out information from her that could be a mitigating factor in during the Cor penalty phase. Correct. And she was involved. So involved in her own defense. So that's unusual. Very also for someone in the middle, right. Very involved in her defense. So here we go. Um, I'm just going to uh, share the video. Look at me like a pro. Here we go. Uh, well, well, sorry. I just want to stop it right there. She's a lover of knitting. She's a yes. grandmother. <laughs> and so all these things to humanize her. But the loving of knitting. So, I mean, is this just a, I didn't know the knitting defense existed. It's an odd defense. It's something I've not heard of before. I, it's like, she, I think they're trying to make her seem grandmotherly. Like she knits like your grandma, but most people's grandmas didn't cut a baby out of a woman's womb. So it, <laughs> it's just not. It's She's not a whiz with those knitting needles. So don't give her the needle. Is that maybe their <laughs> argument? <laughs> So dark. I don't know. I just I, it's, I it's couldn't very, believe when this video started that way. It's they it feels like they're grasping it for something, oh. anything. So that's a really important point. So they didn't, you know, once Diane left at eight, she didn't see Lisa until she was charged with federal crimes for doing this horrific crime. Yeah. Now, so, I I can't hear the video on my end. I'm not sure. Oh. I don't know if everyone else can. I can't. Um, oh, so no. I'm not sure if this is happening everywhere. Can you hear it? Oh no, audio! Let me let me let me check my settings. Sorry, guys, I can. I hear didn't it. want to interrupt it in case other people could hear it. I tried to write you in the no. chat thing about it, but you didn't see it. Ah. Okay, 
Hold on one second. Yeah. Let me, let me take a break, guys, and see if I can fix this. I think it's in the settings, right? Does anyone know? You, uh, you can hear me now. I yeah, can, I can hear, hear it. you. Can other people? You can hear, hear me, it? but not the video, right? Yeah. It, I mean, it doesn't matter as much if I can hear it. I've heard it, but I just hope that people listening can hear it. Hold on one second. Let me just let me investigate. You can hear me, and you can't yeah. hear the video. So what do you think I should do? <laughs> I know. Thank you, guys. What do you think I should do? Should I pause or should I shut down the stream and try to fix it? Hmm. I'm not sure. Like, can other I people think I'm going to pause for a second and just yeah. try to fix it. If you guys can hang on for a second. Let me try to fix it because um, I think it has to do with. Hmm. All right. Let me see. Hold on one second. I'm just going to put myself on mute. All right. I get. I. I don't know. I can't fix it at this. So I guess we'll just talk about what's in the. Yeah, video. we can tell them what they said. <laughs> That's so strange. Yeah, I was hoping it was just something on my end, but they don't know that it is. All right. Well, uh, next time, guys, I'll be a whiz at this. I promise. Um, <laughs> so what she says is that she was gang raped. A police yeah. officer came to the house and she didn't tell the police officer, but what happened at, you know, what you find out through, you know, uh, the trial, uh, just the doc court documents is that she, she went to therapy. Her, her yeah. mother ended up divorcing her stepfather over this, um, yeah. abuse. And she went to therapy. She didn't tell the therapist. Yeah. And there was never any mention of this. <laughs> so it's, just wrote, we don't care about the Vice video. I'll put yeah, it in the it, link. It's just so outrageous. You know, um, so what, you know, there was no mention of this trafficking to the end. And I really think they brought up this trafficking because of cases like Centoya Brown. Yeah. And yeah. another case, uh, Alexis Martin, that, that Kim Kardashian helped get her off. So this yeah. is sort of the new... I don't want to say abuse excuse because it's so overplayed, but this yeah. is the new thing for women offenders is to say they were trafficked, they killed their pimp. They, it, and it certainly plays on my feelings um, yeah. because, you know, nobody wants to see anyone traffic. Nobody was, you know, it's, it's awful experience, but this was never brought up. And Diane, the sister testified. And her response to why she never brought any of these points up in trial was that he didn't ask. The lawyer didn't ask in their pre-trial meeting, and they and he didn't ask on the stand. And she was too upset in both situations that she didn't bring it up. This was the With her sister facing the death penalty of her testimony was to give background and mitigating circumstances. I don't know how that wouldn't have come up. Her lawyer seemed very competent. Right. And so Lisa herself was actually not very cooperative with the lawyer regarding all of this. Like the Lisa's cousin told the lawyer, right. Lisa told me that her stepfather and his friends raped her. And mm -hmm. the stepfather obviously said that never happened. But Lisa refused to discuss it or say if it happened or if it didn't happen. Nothing. Like she wouldn't entertain that going into her defense, from what I understand. 
And then one of their arguments was that she just wasn't comfortable with men and she needed a good <laughs> woman lawyer on her team. And they, she did have a couple of, of women, but they weren't yeah. the right women. Is that their argument? I don't know. Some, you know, she had women. I think the, the federal government ultimately said there is absolutely no evidence that she would have responded better to women because she hadn't responded better to women overall. She had a very good relationship with her attorneys. Uh, she didn't always cooperate with them, but she seemed very comfortable with them to the point where her attorney, God, I can never remember his name, Ducher. It's Duchard, is it? Is it Duchard. Right? I, I cannot remember this man's name for some reason. Um, but <laughs> he was actually, because his client was uncooperative, he decided maybe she would feel more comfortable with a woman. So he brought his wife along. He admits that it was, you know, an unusual choice to make, but he was desperate. And mm -hmm. it, apparently it worked. He said, like, the first conversation with his wife, like, she revealed more than she revealed in any other conversation. Mm -hmm. I think she had 16 meetings with his wife. Wow. Yeah. So it, it's just it's just one sort of failed argument. You know, there's like a 200 page response to their appeal. And yes. it's just one, you know, <laughs> what do you call it? Like slam dunk argument back. Uh, it's basically just like every nonsense. point they bring up. They're like, that's not true. This is what really happens. I mean, I right. even and read you sent me an article about um, the lawyer and how he failed to employ a mitigation specialist and how he was very against mitigation specialists. Mm -hmm. And that was in the Guardian. It was a total hit piece on him. I thought. Yeah. And I double checked just because I thought I was going crazy. He absolutely employed mitigation specialists. <laughs> <laughs> like, absolutely. Like, there's no doubt about it. He always had a mitigation specialist on the team. Um, there was there were points where the team did not meet the qualifications that they needed. Um, but that was never during the trial. Like, during the trial, they were overqualified with the types of lawyers and specialists they needed. <sighs> So they bring up this other sort of feminist claim that, and, and these things, these like clips sound really good. Like one of the things they um, go after the her lawyer for is that, is the way that he interviewed the potential jurors. And the her lawyer said, well, I don't want this one potential juror because she's Cuban. And... <laughs> And Montgomery's <laughs> defense team was like, look, he's a racist. He didn't, he said he didn't want her because she was Cuban. And he's like, no, she didn't speak very English very well. That's why I didn't, he testified. Yeah. That's why I didn't want her to be he's a like, juror. I didn't think she could understand. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds, I mean. I mean, it's such a lesson in the way that they will use something that's true. He did say that but give no context to it yes, or put the wrong context or the wrong meaning to it. So it sounds terrible. You know, it sounds terrible. Yeah, it wasn't, off people I don't want her because she's Cuban. It was, I don't want her on my jury because I don't think she understands what I'm saying. And the other thing they argue is that they say, well, you know, they said that her house, the prosecution brought up that she kept a filthy home, that she wasn't performing femininity correctly like she wasn't a conforming to what they call you know gender gender stereotypes and that's why she was given the death penalty but it, they were in a sort of a funny her defense team argued that she was a good and loving mother yeah it was so they basically they could have gone two ways with it, the defense team, that she was just very mentally ill and she was a bad mother, or she's a good mother, look at all the good she's done, please don't give her the death penalty. And Lisa insisted that they go with the good mother defense. And um, that, and, and how did, when she brought, the, and two of her children, of her four children testified, how did that go? It didn't go well. <laughs> I didn't get to read, like, I wanted to read their actual testimony, but it didn't really go well. I know they, the daughter admitted that her mother wasn't the best mother or the most caring mother or, and the clean part 
was this wasn't the daughter, but like she could not keep her children clean. They would go to school and their teachers would wash their hair for them. This isn't she's not she's failing at femininity. This is like she's failing at the basic caretake being a basic caretaker for her children. Um, it wasn't yeah, because so, she was so she was so different and such a you know a masculine woman. No, you know no. this woman got the death penalty because she did a horrendous thing, and she also they list her lawyer comes on and says this is there's 14 cases that are just like this case. After they made a big deal <laughs> that this is a federal case and we haven't executed a woman federally in 70 years, almost yeah. 70 years. The last woman to get executed was someone who also killed a baby in a kidnapping scheme. Yes. And before that, very sh couple months, you know, less than six months before that was Ethel Rosenberg. So yeah, that's where we're at in the 1953. So she says there's 14 cases that are just like this and they list them on the screen and all these people got life, right? <laughs> Yes. So <laughs> I did a little research. Let me go. So I stopped the, let me find it. Hold on, guys. Hold on one second. I just want to hear you here. First of all, they don't put 14 case people's name no. uh, on the screen. They put 11. So I don't know where the other three went. That's, that's good. But counting. Tiffany Hall, it. starting with Tiffany Hall, plea deal. That's why she didn't get the death penalty. She took a plea deal. With you know, Kathy Coy plea deal, uh, Danelle Lane, uh, the victim. Uh, I don't know. I think that was a a little bit where the victim lived, but the baby died, so uh -huh. that's a little bit different. Uh, Winner Fred, Fred Ransom. She was a schizophrenic and got acquitted for being insane. Darcy Pierce, guilty but mentally ill. I, I mean, I can go on and on, but then they bring up a case where a woman did get the death penalty. Uh, I believe, um, I, I think this was, in, I think this was Felicia Scott in Illinois. Mm -hmm. May, oh. And because Governor Ryan got rid of the death penalty, so she got the death penalty in 1998, and then Ryan, Governor Ryan, got rid of the death penalty in Illinois. So it got commuted. This was not yeah. because it was so similar and that she got some kind of special treatment. These are all state cases. Yeah. So that sister's already, sense. it was so outrageous. Every single one except yeah. one where, um, you know, the jury, maybe that was, you know, a, a little bit, you know, different. Oh, that was Jaquel Williams, by the way. Jacqueline okay. Williams, who who got convicted in ninety eight. Sorry, there's so many of them. There's, yeah. But <laughs> there's two couple no, Illinois sister, cases here. I won't go through them all, but says, it was just outrageous. Yeah, the sister says that um, the the prosecutors took those women's mental health into account. No, they did not. I mean, they did, but they were determined to that their mental illness was not did not explain, and that they, they were out of control. They were not insane most of them like this is not a case of nobody listened to lisa people listened to lisa and it wasn't enough to make anyone think that she didn't deserve death yeah we're not and we're also in missouri too yeah i know this is yeah. a federal case but you know they're not going to be so kind yeah. you know it's not like and some blue state it's true. Yeah. And I mean, there was another thing that her daughters, I think the prosecution asked her daughter on the stands. Uh, the Lisa's lawyer had gone over Lisa being a good mother um, as much as they could. And the daughter said that Lisa counseled her and did all these good things for her. And then the prosecution was like, did your mother ever apologize to you for doing this to your family? And she said no. And Lisa never apologized for anything ever mm. and that did, did not you, help the case mm. did, so do we sufficiently go through her uh, mental state because that's so, sister helen praising's biggest argument is that the state kept her sane enough to execute that without her psychiatric medication she would be psychotic there's, Did we talk about that? We didn't talk about that, no. Um, 
from what I can understand, it was a lot of her team saying that she was psychotic and delusional and the state basically seems to have settled on, and that's the state, the federal government seems to have settled on her being bipolar with like rapid cycling, mm -hmm. which isn't and has never really been an insanity defense. Like that just still doesn't, just because you're, you're, you know, in a manic state or a depressive state, that doesn't mean that you don't know that killing is wrong. It's like, she's, rumors of her mental health have been greatly exaggerated. Like Lisa is competent. She knows right from wrong. She's, I mean, clearly to do what she did, she wasn't in a great, she doesn't have great mental health, but it's not so bad that she couldn't be executed. Like Helen Prejean is greatly exaggerating that. Surprisingly, <laughs> like she's never done that before. <laughs> and they tried to say that, I guess Ford v. Wainwright was decided that to, in order to not be executed, you have to not understand what you that you were being executed executed or Ooh. what for, which is a really high bar to reach. Like hearing voices, being delusional, none of that counts. You either know that you're being executed or you don't. And if you don't, then you are too mentally ill to be executed basically. And Lisa never met that bar. She was heard on the phone talking to people saying if they could wait until Biden was president, she wouldn't be executed. So yeah, they knew. used her telephone. And when she was executed, I thought that there was a very, and she's talking about scripture passages. And this is reported from um, the baby's father, the, ba the, the surviving baby's father went to her execution. And he said that she had a spiritual advisor that was supposed to come in and sing Jesus loves you. But Lisa Montgomery refused this woman entry. So, and the lawyer was very confused and upset and didn't understand. They had all agreed that this was going to happen, that she was the spiritual advisor was going to sing to her as she went to, you know, was given the, the medic, the, the lethal dose and she refused and she was asked if she had any final words and she said no yep nothing she's never ex i think she might have had a better chance at clemency or not getting the death penalty if she ever said sorry but she never expressed any regret for any of it um and and that that was so another argument about the medication that the medication she was taking and I don't know if it was the same, which was Wellibutrin, Depakote, and Elevil for sleep, was keeping her, giving her a flat affect, and and she couldn't show her emotion because of the medication. Her lawyer, not because of her narcissism and her <laughs> psychopathy, but because of her medication, and that's why the jury voted to give her the death penalty. That was another one of their arguments, yeah, which I thought was. Her you lawyer know. at the time successfully told the court, like, if she had a flat affect, if it was a problem, and I thought her medication was at fault, I would have done something. But she was very active. She was always writing notes to her legal team during the trial. Like, she was this, she had a flat affect because that's who she is. It wasn't mm -hmm. that she was on medication. I just thought that, I mean, I just got such a sense of someone where this woman who is her spiritual advisor has donated so much of her time yeah. to get there, to show up for her, to be, you know, to sing to her in public, to do all this stuff for her and just to not even tell her, oh, I changed my mind or don't bother coming to just not, t it just, to me, you know, screams of at the very least selfishness you know, yeah. very well, least. The newspapers reported that her, that the prison denied entry to the spiritual advisor, which I guess is not the case, according to Bobby Joe's husband. Right. Right. Well, of and course, I, the lawyer is going to capitalize on that and say, yes. oh, we had arranged this. Look at how terrible the prison system is. They wouldn't yes. even let her spiritual advisor and they interviewed the guard. The local press is excellent on this. They interviewed yeah. the guard and the guard said, oh, she was, you know, she um, she was, you know, 
she was made available to, Very you know, but. Very so. interesting. Well, and then, sorry, going back to her mental health, there is a recording mm -hmm. that was played at trial between mm -hmm. Lisa and her husband, Kevin. And she told Kevin on the phone from the jail before her trial that she was thinking of ways to mess with the psychologists. Like, I think that alone really got her uh, the death penalty because it was just so indicative that she's not too mentally ill for any of this. She had to pretend to be mentally ill because she wasn't that mentally ill. And what do you think about, you know, Park Dietz was the expert for the prosecution in this case and the trial, and he got burned in, now I'm forgetting her, uh, Andrea uh, Yates' Andrea Yates. trial. Yeah for saying that she got the idea of drowning her kids from a TV show that never aired. And so her whole, her whole, she had to be retried because of that. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you think of him as an expert and was he the right expert for this case? Did you agree with his testimony? I did agree with his testimony. Um, I thought he was, I mean, I know that he messed up with the Andrea Yates case, and I don't know enough about that case, but I do think it's generally decided that she really was uh, like post in postpartum psychosis. This was not the case here. This was, there's just so much evidence that Lisa wanted a baby, so she went out and figured out how to get a baby. She talked about buying a baby before this. She asked her ex-husband for money to buy a baby. There's Park Deeds really hammered in, like, she wasn't delusional. Somebody who is delusional doesn't have to do things to, like, prove that their delusions are true because they believe them so much. She wouldn't have to fake being pregnant. She wouldn't have to fake um, ultrasound pictures for her husband because she truly believed she was pregnant, so why would she have to go get a fake one? Like, that's, he proved over and over again that even though they were mounting a really good defense for her, it just didn't hold any water. And, and this lawyer also got, you know, life sentences, but he also, he's a, a, a um, you know, court appointed lawyer for federal cases. So he had, takes on really serious cases yeah. in Missouri. <laughs> no, Missouri. So it's he not going to. A really bad rap, but. From what I read in all the paperwork for Lisa's trial, at least, he seemed like a very good, caring, competent lawyer. I was impressed with how far he did go to try and prove this. Didn't work, but he tried. It, he did. And um, they also, you know, they also say in this that, um, I was going to say something about park dates, but I forgot. So move on. <laughs> Uh, they also say um, in this vice thing that Trump, this was Trump's execution spree. Yeah. it They, they compare him to being a serial killer, which I, I'm no fan of Trump, but this was, the federal government has executions. They have not been executing anyone for a while. This administration decided to do it. It's fine to be against the death penalty, but these people all, like, there was no cruel and unusual punishment here. They all, like all their juries heard all of these things. Like Lisa's jury heard all about her mental state and the jury decided that what she did was so horrible and that the mitigating factors just didn't mitigate what she did enough. Like she like, was going to get the death penalty at some point, just like Trump just happened to be the one who decided to go through with it. I just really object to that kind of language that to compare Trump, the federal execution with someone who's, who stalked, yeah. went under a fake name, cruelly murdered, stole the baby, lied about it. And, you know, yeah. she had the opportunity to, to, to plead, to take, try to negotiate a plea deal, not go to trial. And she chose to go to trial. Yeah. And that's the chance you take is that she knew that the possibility was, there's a possible chance she would get the death penalty. She chose. So it, it, I think I understand the death penalty, these lawyers. They also show um, 
a psychologist who talks about her mental state being the worst she's ever seen. You know, they basically, it's everybody who's paid by the defense and there's no, no one from the prosecution, no one from um, Bobby, um, Joe Stinton's family. No, you know, just nothing. So it's just all defense propaganda. And a lot of it, you would think if I could in my home, look up 11 cases and find out that that lawyer is totally misrepresenting, (laughs) I would say at least 10 out of 11 of them. And one came kind of close, you know, why can't Vice News with all their resources do the same thing? Why is our, why is our true crime reporting so poor? Oh God, I wish I knew. You know, all they're comparing Lisa's childhood to like the trauma and torture of POW. And I don't, I have no doubt that Lisa did not have a good childhood. It does not seem like her mother is a great person or a caring person necessarily. Um, There seems to be no doubt that she was abused by her stepfather. But to compare her life to the torture that a POW goes through is offensive. It's, Very offensive. It, and there's no evidence of any of it. And when you hear people like Sister Helen Praising talk, she only talks about Lisa Montgomery and the kind of person she is. And she's, you know, she does a really strong a strong job of trying to humanize her and explain that she was a broken person, a delusional person, a person who just snapped. And that's clearly the evidence doesn't support that. So do you think that the, this is so appealing to the public because it's easier to imagine someone who's just so mentally ill and just kind of snaps than someone who is maybe a narcissistic psychopath or someone who, I don't know, her sister called her evil. She says, you know, there's a difference between, I believe she said crazy and evil. She's evil. I mean, I don't want to get too into kind of the idea of evil, but is it easier to kind of understand that way for us? I think it is. And, you know, I think it plays on a lot of our sympathies. Like Again, if I truly believed that Lisa Montgomery had was this mentally ill and had lived such a tortured life, I probably would feel more sympathetic and different about it had I not read all this other stuff to the contrary. But it plays on our sympathies, the tr- human trafficking, um, horrible sexual abuse in her childhood. You know, a lot of women can relate to her wanting to be a mother. I think it just hits all the right notes. And she doesn't look evil. She doesn't look frightening. She's kind of a very, you know, you just, you wouldn't look at her twice kind of person. So I think it just, it all makes us sympathetic to her. But I do think that deep down, she, like, this wasn't because of her trauma. I mean, she probably was broken by her trauma, but she was broken and became a terrible person because of it. Not that she was so broken that she couldn't help herself, I guess. That's going to be the one thing I agree with her sister. And I feel for her sister. Obviously, she felt like she had a protector role when she was a child. She came back to the trial to try yeah. to do something good for her. I feel for her sister, but where my heart is... it. Um, is with Stinnett's family and friends. Yeah. Um, that's just where, you know, my heart goes. But I don't know. Do people have questions about this? Thanks, Andy. And I mean, you know, once I hear, I think I just, once I heard knitting and trafficking, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those two know. things put, know. sort of burn my well, BS meter. Now, and anytime... There- it, it kind of does a disservice. Trafficking is not a license to, to murder someone. I'm sorry. If no, that makes most, me politically traffic, incorrect, so be it. Most people who suffer the things that they're saying that Lisa suffered don't go on to, to cut babies out of wombs. Like, suffering horrible trauma doesn't make you become a bad person. It can make you become, you know, a damaged, broken person, but... It, Lisa was a bad person. It turned her into, I don't know, a psychopath or a narcissist. I'm not trying to diagnose her, but she didn't care that she had to take Bobby Stinnett's baby. She Mm -hmm. just wanted that baby. And that's not something that, like, I think it's offensive to 
people who really did have horrible childhoods because they didn't grow up to do this. Right. That's a really good point. Um, you know, uh, play, we steal Plato's snakes says my mother was raped from being a toddler to two years before she gave birth to me. She never cut a baby out of someone's <laughs> ludicrous defense. Ag agreed. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they report it wrong on purpose. You know, a lot of the local press was fantastic on this. So kudos to Missouri local press. I wish I remembered the names of the yeah. articles I read were really excellent and very in depth. Um, any questions from anybody? Um, Cause I'm a kind of, this is a really, I think this was fascinating, but not fascinating for the, I think just legally it was, the arguments were very interesting. Do you agree? Oh, and that just, you just reminded me of the other legal argument. When they mm -hmm. applied for um, relief for, I think it was the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, um, because she was too insane to be executed, they applied four days before the execution. And the federal government was basically like, first of all, you've already had one stay because her lawyers had COVID. And there's no evidence that you're going to actually, that she is this insane. There's, you have zero merit. Like this argument has zero merit. So we're not going to do this because you're just jerking the court around was essentially what they were saying. Mm -hmm. they, like, they, the court was not amused by this request like four days before the execution. That's they said, right. That's a really good point. They thought they purposely stalled. And, and her, her her trial was also stalled, you know, multiple times too. Yeah. You know, for various reasons. They tried to use COVID, everything at the last, they just threw everything. And well, yeah. I don't have a problem. I mean I have a pro. I, I guess I have a big pro because the court is very orderly and can sort through the nonsense. But our pre this is our press used to do some of this, but it does seems our national press seems to do none of this anymore. Yeah. And just, yeah. you know, so I, I do have a problem <laughs> with the way that this got, you know, so much time from her side and they so much they, money thrown at they, it that they abandoned the idea of legally getting her clemency or mm -hmm. getting her clemency under like a legal argument a long time ago and we're hoping that public outcry would do that job for them right and novjm legislation the great nov uh, that's the national organization of victims of juvenile murderers now as a youtube channel um so she brought uh they brought up um, that Centoya Brown also killed and said that it was self-defense. I mean, this isn't a self-defense said, oh, well, it's trafficking. So, you know, it was yeah. in self-defense that was rejected in the court, but it, it went over in the court of public opinion mm -hmm. and, and it's reported that were, I mean, they, they put her age down to, you know, I, we, I joke with my friend that she was seven years old and she killed her pimp. You know, her age just gets lower and lower in every article. It, but, it's sort of like how Lisa Montgomery, if you actually figured out what her sister's saying, she would have been a baby and nobody ever claimed that Lisa was abused as a baby or a toddler. Or traffic to men as a three-year-old. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be horrific and a totally different story. Totally different. I mean, it's just... I incur, I'm sorry that the sound didn't work, guys. I will have it working or I will abandon, sorry, Streamyard, this program, but I'll have <laughs> no, it working next time. The video, and, everybody. Um, but, oh, the one other thing quickly before we go, you know, yeah. is abuse is excuse. The first time I heard that was the Menendez trial. Do you remember yeah. a trial previous to that where uh, mm. that was talked about? Not that I can think of. Um. Definitely Menendez was what really brought it to, you know, mainstream. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's such a hard thing because I feel so much sympathy for people who have been abused. And I honestly, when I hear about Lisa's childhood, the stuff that was spoken about in the first trial, I feel it sounds terrible. It really does. But she wasn't tortured like a POW. And none of that m makes it okay to murder anybody anyway. Not in the in, in this way, you know. Um, Andy Cummings brings up Eileen Warnos, who oh, has gosh. a lot of feminist fans. Yeah, who feel that what she who are so anti prostitution, um, 
you know, so am I, yeah. but you know, they support, they think that what she did was justified. I, I don't know. Uh, it's just, it's very wild, not discussed. And the Menendez trial, the abuse excuse, that was a particular, I just wanted to bring that up because they were arguing, what the defense was arguing was that they were so abused that they believe they killed in self-defense because they believed the parents who were eating ice cream and watching TV at the time were going to kill them. They had the... Um, you know, oh, it, that they were arguing that it was reasonable with their abuse that they would feel threatened by the, you know, it, it's a whole, it's a, it's a creative defense for sure. And it certainly hung a jury once. Yeah. So. Yeah. I just, I, I don't want to sound insensitive to abuse victims because I have so much sympathy for them, but people are also using it as an excuse to get away with murder, literally. And we, you can't just say, oh, well, you had a tough childhood. You, you don't, you're not responsible for cutting a baby out of a pregnant woman. Like you're still, you still did that and you're still responsible. How similar is this to Dorothy Otno Lewis's documentary? <laughs> oh God, it's such a similar argument. It's Dorothy just wanted everyone to be, what was it? Multiple personalities. So they weren't responsible if their other personality did it. This is, you know, you're not responsible if you're mentally ill at all, I guess, is sort of what they're saying. Because, yeah, she's bipolar. That is a mental illness. But that doesn't make anyone kill people. I've never heard of that excuse before. And they also argued that in this case also that she had brain damage. Oh, yes. And... Uh, too, which is what Dorothy Otno Lewis the was brain arguing. Damage. They had some kind of brain damage where they, you know, couldn't yeah. couldn't recognize what they were doing. It was very clear that she could recognize what she was doing. She yes. covered her tracks with a lot of stories. It's just an insult to people who and live with brain there damage. Was I, actually, no evidence of brain damage from what I read. <laughs> like right. they said there was brain damage, but they couldn't produce the results, and they couldn't no. reproduce the results. And the only time the federal government could reproduce the results was when they were like fudging with the testing methods and not doing mm -hmm. it correctly. Mm -hmm. So there was yeah. no, that's not a mitigating factor. She didn't have brain damage. She had a few concussions. Yeah. Oh, and uh, to the great Tuesday money who does the introduction for this podcast and who has her own um, podcast the Elephant Lounge says, um, yeah, and Jody and her finger, she sliced it, stabbing her abuser. And that's one thing that the daughter brought up, that she saw cuts on her fingers and yes. that she had recently, Montgomery had recently cut her nails. Yes. And, but they still found the DNA um, of um, Bobby Joe under her fingernails. So the other thing, the <laughs> I swear this is the, the last thing I'm going to bring up is <laughs> <laughs> because I'm very familiar. I, I grew up in an anti-death penalty family. Uh, my mother was very anti-death penalty. And one of the things they argue is that the victims, the family and friends never receive any peace from the these kind of executions, that it does nothing. And I found it very interesting. There was a um, Twitter, um, there was some of the friends gave a interview to the news and said, this will be closure for us. And some of there was a tweet hashtag going around justice, justice for Bobby Joe. And a lot of her friends and family were saying, finally, this is finally giving us closure. It's just, I, I find it curious that we never hear from family or friends who said, wow, that execution really, they're not pushed yeah. out to the forefront by the anti-death penalty movement. They're not they're pushed not in front of the cameras. Strangely. Not at all, but they usually do say, like, this is closure. It's finally over. And mm -hmm. I, I've read that multiple times. I've read that, oh God, I looked this up a long time ago, but statistics are it does provide closure to the families of the victims. Do you think I, that the anti-death penalty movement will go after life without parole like they did with juveniles? I think uh, so if, if we got rid penalty. of the death penalty federally, like and state all statewide, Joe Biden wants to get rid of it federally and statewide. Do you think that they would go after life without parole? Would I think they would try. Life? I do think they would try. I, part of me thinks it would get better if they got rid of the death penalty. 
uh, they, they wouldn't, you know, there's some sort of, there's an urgency with the death penalty that there isn't with people who are in for life. But mm -hmm. I also think it's terrifying the idea that they could go after life next because people who, the, the juries listen to all the factors and they still decide that these people deserve life or death. And we need to remember that this didn't happen. Like they, they heard all of this just because there's a video saying they didn't hear these fact mitigating factors doesn't mean that they didn't. They, this jury did hear them and they still decided that what Lisa did was so horrific that they mm -hmm. gave her death. Um, Dorothy Marie Recovery Support is saying, I, I wouldn't want the death penalty if my loved one was murdered. Um, and we saw that with Chris, um, I'm sorry, Shanann Watts's yeah. uh, family requested that the death penalty, you do see that oh, yeah. uh, I think with loved ones. The loved ones don't want it. I think they definitely need to take that into account because then if you execute them you're and they don't want that, you're re-traumatizing them all over again. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, I think prosecutors should take that into account for sure, but they, I think that if the family does want it, that should also be considered. Yeah, it, it, this is, I, I, you know, it's something, it's a subject I really have to get a little bit, I, you know, uh, obviously my feelings have changed since, uh, since I started, you know, really researching some of these cases. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly don't feel bad that Lisa Montgomery, I feel bad for her family. Um, yes. But when does, you know, responsibility come in? You know, I, I don't know. I yeah. feel like she had some, feel bad for the people peripherally who are affected by it um, in her yeah. family. But I hope it's given um, Bobby Justin's family and friends some peace and um, that she won't be doing appeals and, yeah, you know, so, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that they've been traumatized for the last 15 years waiting on this, which is another, you know, downside of the death penalty. Like I'm not here to debate the death penalty, but it is a downside that they can't just leave the trial and go on with their lives because it's going to keep happening until the execution. Yeah. It, it's just, um, <laughs> I saw a tweet saying, uh, we were talking about Allison. Al I will be at Allison Max sentencing on Wednesday. It oh, may go another day. There may be so many uh, victim impact statements. They've set aside Thursday as well. So I'm not sure exactly how I'm going, if I'm going to do a live show or if I'm going to do mm -hmm. uh, uh, a sort of a tape show and have it come out a little later. I'm not sure, but I will be there. But someone was saying, you know, I'm anti I'm anti, you know, I, what is the word they used? I think it was like, you know, basically incarceration, but Alice and Mac should get everything, get the book throw. I was like, what an interesting case. Alice and I mean, I know, it's horrific yeah. what she did, but Alice and Mac that you don't believe anyone, not a, you know, some kind of serial murder. So that is interesting. What, yeah. you know, what cases draw people's sympathy and what don't. Do you have yeah. anything you'd like to plug, Shana? I don't. I don't. Um, I just <laughs> think that um, I don't want people to leave this thinking that, you know, we hate victims. You know, Lisa Montgomery was a victim. She just chose to do a terrible thing while also having been a victim. And I feel terrible for the little girl who suffered, but she turned into an adult who made other people suffer for it. And I just mm. think that we need to all take that into account. Agreed. Agreed. And and I wish, I wish that the death penalty were, was argued on its own merits and not yes. using kind of the, these cases. Yes. Uh, Each lying, basically case. lying. I'll say it like it is lying about these cases to portray a false narrative of what happened in the case and um, what happened, how our legal system works, defaming lawyers, defaming our legal system. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not necessary. If, you, if you're against the death penalty, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not necessarily sure that I'm for it. Um, I just don't think that you should take each case and make the family of the victim suffer all over again by saying, you know, it's not that bad what they did. Like that mm -hmm. bothers me. 
Agree. Shana, thank you so much. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. And um, thank you for your patience. And thank you. And I also want to um, thank Addy Abdu McDonald, who is the producer of the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, for all the helpful and incredible work she does all year round. You are the best. All right. Have a great rest of the day, guys. Bye. Bye.